Good afternoon it's Monday the 18th of May 2020 just after one o'clock welcome to UK Column News your host today Mike Robinson myself Brian Gerrish and we're delighted to be joined by David Scott bringing us northern exposure from north of the border well good news uh, yes yes good news Brian because uh, we've got new symptoms uh, to look out for so from today uh, all individuals should self-isolate if they de develop a new continuous cough a new fever or uh, and somia, uh, if that's how you pronounce it, anosmia, sorry, I do apologize, right? So there you go, anosmia. Uh, that, uh, anosmia is a loss of or a change in your normal sense of smell. It can also affect your sense of taste uh, as the two are closely linked. Uh, and uh, the uh, various uh, chief medical officers for Wales, Northern Ireland, Scotland and England say, uh, we have been closely monitoring the emerging data and evidence on COVID-19 and after thorough consideration, we're now confident enough to recommend this new measure. Uh, the individual households uh, should also self-isolate for 14 days as per the current guidelines and so on. So here we are at the very end of this whole thing, or are we? Uh, but uh, because of course we're expecting a second wave imminently, uh, but uh, we have new symptoms to look out for. Uh, people should continue to self-isolate as much as possible. It's, it's incredible. And I'll just add, I had a long conversation with a very experienced medical person a couple of days ago who said, of course, if you're wearing a mask, you're breathing in your own stale air. And actually, this is quite dangerous, particularly for elderly people, because you're reducing the oxygen content in your body and that is affecting your immune system. So none of these alternative views getting anywhere near the media at all, Mike, but in come these measures. Um, absolutely. Even better news, though, Brian, because uh, there is uh, a new license ag agreement signed between Oxford University and AstraZeneca. Uh, and that means if the Oxford University's vaccine is successful, uh, AstraZeneca will work to make up to 30 million doses available. Uh, and that will ultimately end up being around 100 million doses in total. Uh, so the government is backing this initiative with uh, funding of 84 million pounds uh, and that funding includes 65 and a half million for the vaccine being developed at the University of Oxford and 18 and a half million for Imperial College London uh, as coronavirus vaccine trials get underway. Um, so uh, brilliant, eh? Brilliant. But you notice on Oxford Vaccine Group there, it's clinical vaccine research and immunisation education so we're going to get in the education to make sure people know that they've got to have this uh, absolutely uh, alex sharma who's the business secretary said our scientists are at the forefront of vaccine development and this deal with astrazeneca means that uh, if the oxford university vaccine works uh, people in the uk will be the first to access it now they're hoping that this is all going to happen by the autumn uh, but it doesn't end there uh, because we have uh, uh, also uh, uh, this uh, VMIC. This is the Vaccine Manufacturing and Innovation Centre. Uh, so they have been given uh, a load of money as well. Um, they're going to open 12 months ahead of schedule, apparently. £93 million pounds going to this. Uh, and that's going to open the, ver the UK's first dedicated vaccine manufacturing and innovation centre. Uh, £38 million pounds will also establish a rapid deployment facility. So uh, the new centre is being described as the government as a key component component of the coronavirus program uh, and it's going to boost the UK's capacity to develop and mass produce vaccines uh, so 93 million pounds going to that uh, and uh, uh, as I say it's going to be supplemented by this uh, uh, this new rapid deployment uh, centre which is going to make sure that we get all the vaccines that we need uh, by the autumn um, so this is a bit confusing, Brian, I, I, I can't work this out. So let's have a look and see what we've got here. Uh, we've got 84 million pounds going to the Astra, AstraZeneca deal, which is going to produce up to 100 million doses, 30 million initially. Um, so that's going to vaccinate just about everybody in the country. Uh, and then we've got 38 million pounds as part of this other 90 million pound thing going to this rapid deployment, which is going to provide doses for the entire population. Um, so I'm just wondering how many doses do we need uh, and is it is it normal that we have uh, a, a, a purely for-profit initiative in the AstraZeneca uh, project plus a, a not-for-profit um, initiative through the uh, rapid deployment uh, unit? 
uh, mechanism. So, David, I'm not sure what you think about that. How does that how does that work in practice? We we seem to be heading towards having enough doses of this vaccine for uh, two United Kingdoms. Well, there's a whole world out there, Mike. A whole world of uh, eager. Um, is it victims or is it uh, patients? I'm not quite sure what the word is. I, I would like to know um, the testing, the rollout testing. Does that include the gold standard of testing of these things? Double blind placebo controlled testing to make sure the vaccine is both safe and effective? Uh, no, there's not, there's not, there's not, there's not, there's not going to be any testing. I mean, come on. How can you possibly have the thing rolled out by the autumn if there's going to be testing? That would be, that would be silly. So, so it's it's such a such an emergency that we have to forego making sure it's safe and effective in order to protect the public. Is that the argument? Uh, that seems to be the argument. Yes, and and of course uh, we we shouldn't let this go without mentioning. Thanks to the person who sent these pictures through to me uh, today's uh, uh, Daily Mail and Daily Express. Uh, half of Britons could get jab in months. Britons raced for thirty million uh, to get vaccine by autumn. Uh, this was uh, all across the front pages this morning. Um, uh, not not really surprising, but you know what? <laughs> the, the the race is on to get this this uh, thing developed. And as you say, David, um, th there is a whole world out there. There seems to be quite a lot of competition between the various players to get something out on the market as quickly as possible. Uh, where does that leave us? Um, well, it leaves us here, perhaps, because uh, this is the UK's biobank uh, and. Uh, this is all about immunity now. So that what the government is admitting at this point is, of course, they've no clue uh, actually how far this thing has spread, what type of herd immunity there might be out there already. Uh, and they want to be able to measure that because, of, of course, if they're going to justify uh, delivering this amount of vaccinations, uh, they're going to have to uh, prove that it's needed. Um, so this is a, a large scale study of coronavirus immunity. Uh, up to 20,000 people are being asked to take part by Biobank. Uh, in a new government funded study to track the extent of coronavirus spread across England, Scotland and Wales. Uh, and uh, Biobank, established by Wellcome Trust and Medical Research Council, um, it has been following the health of 500,000 people in the UK over the last 10 years uh, through their health records, through genetic records, through lifestyle data. Uh, and so the government considers them best placed uh, to run this. This trial, this is what uh, Matt Hancock had to say about this. Uh, our response to this pande pandemic is rightly guided by the science and based on the best available evidence. So I'm determined to do everything we can do to learn more about coronavirus. Uh, and so the UK Biobank study uh, will build our understanding of the rate of COVID-19 infection in the general population. And importantly, it would add to our knowledge about the risk factors uh, that mean the virus can affect uh, individuals differently. Um, so David, finally, they seem to be uh, uh, getting around to trying to work out what the actual spread is in the country. But as I say, that seems to be uh, very uh, coincidental with the timing of the announcement on the vaccine. So it seems to me that the, the, the motivation for this is to justify uh, the vaccination program. Yes, and this is bizarre because another way of saying the spread of the virus is to say the extent of immunity, because once you've had it, you're immune, which is the whole purpose of vaccination is to sort of simulate that and, it, 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 and, and get the immunity by artificial means. So once you've had the virus, you're immune. So saying the spread of the virus is the same as saying the spread of immunity to the virus. Um, and also, Matt Hancock, anyone who uses the phrase the science doesn't know anything about science. It's a giveaway. Uh, yeah, absolutely. OK, well, David, to answer your question, really, are vaccines safe? The answer is they're not. And there's a there's a lot of proof of that. But probably this is a good start. Uh, several people sent me a little film clip of uh, Bill Gates. I've put the link to that clip on screen so you can type it in yourself to see it. It's not very long. It's about 50 seconds long. But in it, he says this, the efficacy of vaccines in older people is always a huge challenge. It turns out the flu vaccine isn't that effective on elderly people. We clearly need a vaccine that works in the upper age range because they are most at risk of that. And doing that, so you amp it up, you, uh, what he's saying there is you increase the uh, potency of the vaccine, you amp it up for the older people. 
and you don't have side effects uh, we have one in ten thousand with side effects that's way more seven hundred thousand people who will suffer from that and that actual decision of let's go and give this vaccine to the entire world governments will have to be involved because there will be need, there will there will be some risk and indemnification will be needed so it's a really extraordinary little film clip where bill gates is happy to say yeah there are risks to the virus it, uh, to the vaccine it doesn't work in some cases and yeah possibly if we push it out you know a mere 700,000 people could suffer well what could the suffering be I'm going to thank one of our viewers for reminding me that if we go to the British government's own website we can see of course the sort of stuff that vaccines can do because here's the British government offering to make payments to people damaged by vaccines extraordinary isn't it if you produce motor cars Mike and somebody got damaged because your car was defective the government wouldn't be stepping up and saying we'll cover the cost they'd be uh, going to the manufacturer to pay absolutely but not when it's uh, the vaccine and industry bill gates and big pharma so here's the british government vaccine damage payment that must mean that people are suffering as the result of vaccines it says you could get a one-off tax-free payment of 120,000 pounds well if the rest of your life is damaged of course that's woefully in inadequate uh, what are they talking about you could get a payment if you're severely disabled and your disability was caused by vaccination against any of the following diseases and there's the great long list uh, it says this uh, that um, normally you must be have been vaccinated before your 18th birthday so if you're an adult and you get a vaccination that's nothing to do with the British government even though you may suffer and then they list uh, some of the things that you're going to be vaccinated for but this is where it comes home disablement is worked out as a percentage and severe disablement means at least 60 percent disabled uh, David it's pretty clear that the government knows full well that vaccines are dangerous and um, it appears that it's uh, prepared to um, dole out cash to cover up for the mistakes of the vaccine industry it's odd the government doesn't mention death because the inserts within the vaccine manufacturer's information where they're obligated to advise people what the risks are does mention death and um also uh, talking about old people and flu vaccines well they have in the past more than one occasion caused a, an epidemic of of guillain barre syndrome which is uh, from the from the website here of the NHS um very rare serious condition that affects the nerves affects hands feet limbs causing problems such as numbness weakness and pain essentially paralysis um and this is this is associated with the flu vaccine this is an extremely nasty condition um and we're not talking about the risks of that it would appear uh, no we're not and I take your point about deaths because we know that we've got UK column viewers who have lost children uh, literally on the end of a needle as a result of vaccination but let's come into the two meter rule because we're now into the new normal or abnormal as some people prefer to call it uh, where we're into the realms of social distancing etiquette we decided to find out where the two meter rule had come from so we emailed Public Health England this is the response on your screen um, now I've taken out the lady's name who sent it to me because she was extremely pleasant very helpful and we don't need to bring her into what this is about but she very quickly responded uh, giving me two documents which we're now just going to take our viewers and listeners through and remember we had to go to Public Health England because Imperial College said when we asked them have you got the research into the two metre rule they said nothing to do with us you need to go to Public Health England so this is the first of the documents uh, COVID-19 infection prevention and control guidance and um, you can see all the caveats on it on the right hand side it's issued jointly by the Department of Health and Social Care Public Health Wales Public Health Agency, Northern Ireland, Health Protection Scotland, etc. So they're all in the club, and this is the key document uh, apparently for the two meter rule. Well, just to give you a bit of extra information, it tells you something about COVID 19. 
and uh, basically it says that most patients will not be infectious until the onset of symptom, symptoms in most cases individuals are usually considered infectious while they have symptoms how infectious individuals are depends on the severity of their symptoms and stage of their illness but key point here that you've got to have the symptoms and many people of course did not get any symptoms whatsoever they've gone through the whole epidemic uh, feeling perfectly well but let's get into the more detailed stuff here and um, so we've got main changes to the guidance and I spotted this one patient contact is now defined as being within two meters rather than within one meter of a patient which is more precautionary and is consistent with the distancing recommendations used elsewhere now this of course is highlighting the fact <coughs> excuse me that this document <coughs> is based on uh, an NHS medical setting this is not to do with the public out and about uh, we've got this introduction and organize all preparedness and it says here the transmission of COVID-19 is thought to occur mainly through respiratory droplets generated by coughing and sneezing um, it's interesting isn't it thought to so we still don't really know what we're dealing with although this is put forward as a definitive paper uh, so it says thought to occur mainly through respiratory droplets generated by coughing and sneezing and through contact with contaminated surfaces so what have we got on this one transmission based precautions definition well when you go to contact precautions what does it say used to prevent and control infection trend infection transmission via direct contact or indirectly from the immediate care environment this is the most common route of infection transmission so David um, I've got more on this document but very quickly when you get into it you find that it's contradictory we're told we should be worried about respiratory transfer droplet transfer but it's telling us here very clearly that the most dangerous route is by touching surfaces yes and this uh, mentioned one meter is now two meters not one meter why was it ever one meter well that's what the world health organization recommends and of course in germany it's 1.5 meters and elsewhere it's 1.2 it's arbitrary and this arbitrary number based on nothing very much in particular is being used to transform for example primary school uh, as they reopen into strange and alien places where the teachers don't touch the children where the child is in distress or or wets himself or all the other things that happen in in in, in, in the lower levels of primary school that the, the child won't get any assistance because the child might be deadly and they have to sit in little areas taped off it's it's bizarre it is bizarre and uh, it gets more bizarre so let's uh, follow through we'll add a bit to this one on screen uh, let's bring it up here uh, so this is where it starts to talk uh, distances the maximum distance for cross transmission from droplets has not been definitively determined but we've destroyed a whole country's economy on the basis that people can't be together but it's not been definitively determined although a distance of approximately two meters around the infected individual has frequently been reported so this is not the average individual this is a known infected case they're talking about so let's go on because nerve tag the really sensitive part of the um, medical and scientific expertise inside the sage group is nerve tag and they say this it's biologically plausible that chest compressions could generate an aerosol but only in the same way that an exhalation breath would do no other mechanism exists to generate an aerosol other than compressing the chest and an expiration breath much like a cough is not currently recognized as a high risk event um, so we're back on the fact that uh, they don't see coughs as being a big problem now this is talking inside the medical environment of course so that's why it's set out in that way so it's saying if you're doing chest compressions or defibrillation this is not a 
an increased risk. Uh, well, that's very strange because if I remember rightly, one of the reasons that we were told that we were going to be experiencing blanket do not resuscitate orders was because of the risk of uh, CPR causing infections. Yes. So, so <laughs> when you go into this document, Mike, within the first few paragraphs, you're asking question after question because there's no substance, there's no definitive science. I'm going to come on to some in a minute, but in this document there isn't, and yet we've shut down a whole nation. It, it's incredible. Well, it ends with a graphic because, of course, adults can only understand graphics. So here's a visual guide to safe PPE for COVID-19 safe ways of working. But of course, it doesn't mention anything to do with the distancing rule. Now, this is the meat of it because this is the document. And I know you can't see it because it's very small on screen, but I'm going to bring up the main points. Uh, this is... Uh, um, how far droplets can move in indoor environments. And this is the, supposedly the scientific analysis on the spread of these airborne droplets. So how far can the droplets move in indoor environments? A large number of infectious diseases are believed to be transmitted between people via large droplets and airborne routes. So now we've got the uncertainty. We only believe this. Exhaled air is treated as steady state, non-isothermal, uh, warm, uh, a warm air basically, and it's a jet coming out horizontally into stagnant surrounding air. That is a description of how they've looked at the model for what they're doing. And this is the meat of it. Our study reveals that for respiratory exhalation flows, the size of the largest droplets that would totally evaporate before falling two meters away are between 60 and 100 micron and these expelled large droplets are carried more than six meters away by exhaled air at a velocity of 50 meters a second sneezing more than two meters away at a velocity of 10 meters a second coughing and less than one meter away at a velocity of one meter a second breathing so even when you get into this document, there is no study whatsoever of this in a building that has a ventilation system like a hospital or indeed in the fresh air. But uh, David, I wonder if I can challenge you on the last statement. And I'll, I'll probably have to read it to you again. But they say that their study reveals that for respiratory exhalation flows, the sizes of the largest droplets that would totally evaporate before falling two meters away of between 60 and 100 micron. And then they go to say how far these large droplets are carried. But they've already said that they evaporate before two meters. So how do they travel six meters? I can't help you there, Brian. Look, perhaps you could help me though. We've got a disease that has a case fatality rate of we now think something around 0.1% almost all of which are the elderly and infirm. And if you're healthy and, in, in, and, and, and relatively young, you're under 70, it's almost no risk at all. And yet we've instructed people to not resuscitate people who are dying on the basis of that vanishingly small risk. And we're still outside clapping them every Thursday. I'm confused as to the rationale behind any of that. Well, well, I think I think David, one of the things that we can see here is that, that within the, this this type of documentation, which is supposedly authoritative about how the people are, are treated, um, we see the same type of uh, problems of of confusing narratives as we're seeing with the with the whole live stream, uh, what we're supposed to do during the lockdown story it seems to be that every level along this the reason that people are so confused about what what boris johnson has presented during his uh, his live stream last sunday uh last sunday was because this confusion seems to be right the way through from the scientific so-called experts right through to the politics so so how can we possibly have any rational response to this? Well, and if we haven't got a rational government, we haven't got a country. And indeed, at the moment, we haven't got a country. Let me just add a couple of bits, uh, a label here. So the two meter rule does not protect an individual from another person's sneeze or cough. That's the reality of it. 
and but there's no risk assessment and david just come back to you this is the thing i find amazing that if you've carried out a scientific study and you've got some sort of a an idea of what risk is the next thing you should do is carry out a full risk analysis and on the basis of that risk analysis you would make the decision about what you're going to shut and why but clearly there has been no risk analysis done and th this is well it, it's not just madness this this is deliberate omission in my opinion y yes this is the point we we're making last week about the boris johnson's traffic lights thing uh, color spectrum thing that the the criteria for getting down to level one was no transmission none zero it wasn't risk based none of these things make any sense because you're not talking about absolute safety because there is no absolute safety in life that does not exist that can never exist therefore if you're going to take precautions which affect how you live your life they have to be based on some sort of assessment as to what the risk is and if it's vanishingly small less than one in a million per year is usually considered vanishingly small then it's ignored it's just background it's just one of those things and it's only when it gets much higher than that you know tenfold hundredfold thousandfold higher than that that it starts becoming so significant that some change to how we act is sensible without risk there is no basis for any change to our behavior yeah uh, and, and uh, sorry just say this brian you know that this comes back to this use of the precautionary principle they they have claimed that the two meter rule is there uh, uh they're being extra cautious with respect to taking these precautions precautionary principle in action there but there's no precautionary principle for vaccines and there's no precautionary principle for just to pick something yeah. out of the air 5g for example but but precautionary principle all the way with this where it seems to fit the government policy is where yeah. the precautionary principle gets applied well i'm going to show you where the precautionary principle doesn't apply with this so let's return to that public health england document and in it is a note that says this uh, it's talking about uh, uniforms in the nhs it is best practice to change in and out of uniforms at work and not wear them when traveling this is based on public perception rather than evidence of an infection risk this does not apply to community health workers who are required to travel between patients in the same uniform and what i've put at the top is that if you speak to retired nurses they will tell you that in their early nhs careers they were not allowed to wear their uniforms to and from work to avoid bringing dirt and disease into the hospital so if you think about it you can sit on the used chewing gum on your seat on the underground you can brush your uniform past the handrail where all the grubby hand and the disease is you can let the material soak up the coughs and sneezes of the person pressed next to you you can have a bit of dirt and grime from the street whipped up by the by the wind you can add a few diesel and petrol fumes and then walk straight onto the sterile nhs ward and that's encouraged because it's only really public perception, perception. Mm. it's it's mind-blowing and this one's really for you mike because um uh, this was um uh the bbc here talking about what was in the papers uh, but i noticed in here it's it said that police are warning people not to step away from others on the on the pavements um because the mail reports it's dangerous and the risk of passing on the virus by briefly crossing paths is low mm. so again now we've got something else where they're saying well actually the risk when you're just outside is low well it's not just low it's minusculely low to uh, insignificant um, absolutely uh, now David uh, Sweden of course is, is on everybody's lips because they have not uh, gone into the type of lockdown that we've seen uh, in this country uh, and uh, well somebody here has uh, has posted a, a graphic on Twitter uh, showing the total uh, cause mortality for Sweden over the last, what is that, 20 years or so? Um, and uh, well, they're certainly below their peak. Well, this is it. This is uh, total mortality in Sweden for the months of uh, uh, January through April. Um, and it's a case of, can you spot the epidemic? And no, you can't. You look at the last, um 
uh, the, the, the last year's total there. It's more than the year before, less than the year before that. The overall trend is down, which is very encouraging. And there is nothing happening. This is background. This is normality. It's not the new normal. It's the normal normal. Uh, absolutely. So, uh, so why are we doing what we're doing? Uh, and uh, interesting little graphic from the College of Policing here. Uh, officers should only enforce the health protection regulations. Government guidance is not enforceable. Uh, for example, two metre distancing, avoiding public transport or the wearing of face coverings in enclosed spaces. So, uh, well, Brian's just gone through the two metre distancing situation, showing that it's not based on anything in particular. But uh, the police then seem to have been uh, uh, trying to enforce something which their own College of Policing says they shouldn't be enforcing. This is right. The, the police have been trying to enforce government diktat and the politicians' opinion or advice as though it were law when it's not. And the senior police uh, organisations have had to step in and provide a bit of guidance. Uh, a little too late for some. Uh, because there has been a bit of backtracking in the world of policing over the handling of COVID-19. We see here first from Scotland, um, the, uh, the, the Scottish Chief Constable has, uh, this is uh, Ian Livingston, has been uh, having to backtrack. Um, uh, some article here says top cop Ian Livingston says some Scots have been wrongly fined for being out during lockdown. They say fined, they of course mean given fixed penalty notices. Um, and uh, they quote uh, Livingston here, there will have been time when a fixed penalty notice may have been issued, but it was in actual fact it, inappropriate to do so. Uh, we've apologised, we've spoken to the officers involved, we've spoken to the members of the public. So some people have got some apologies and have had uh, presumably their uh, fixed penalty notices rescinded. Uh, England and Wales, no better, perhaps worse, uh, because uh, we're reporting here in the Times that uh, in fact, all charges under the new coronavirus act that's not the regulations the act uh, have in fact been unlawful uh, britain's most senior police officer has apologized after it emerged that everyone prosecuted under the coronavirus act have been unlawfully charged oh dear uh, 44 in uh, individuals have been charged uh, the charges have been withdrawn or set aside because they were wrong the crown prosecution has revealed uh, that's heartening that they're actually revealing that a further 12 people were charged under another tranche of coronavirus legislation. The health protection coronavirus regulations have also had cases abandoned due to errors, quote, usually involving uh, Welsh regulations being applied in England or vice versa. So we're not too sure which country we're in and uh, the, the backtracking continues. Uh, but there has been some, uh, some reaction to all this. Well, I've got a couple of, uh, a couple of examples here of how the public are starting to see uh, the actions of the police and it's not good. Uh, we see here um, one, one Photoshop photograph where half Nazi officer, half police officer have been uh, photoshopped together. And this, the, the text is, I was just following orders. Now, this is unfortunately valid criticism because that's what's happening. Orders have been given, orders have been followed. followed. The law, which is meant to protect us all, is being ignored and people's rights are being infringed. Uh, and we've also got uh, one, do you have what it uh, takes to be a contact tracer? This is uh, the government was recruiting contact tracers to uh, to watch the population and track us all down. Uh, might not be now because the software doesn't work, uh, but that's been applied over a German World War II uh, recruitment poster for the SS. So that shows how some people are seeing this. And this view that the authoritarian response of the state is in fact oppression is gaining ground and gaining it rapidly. Mm. Well, speaks for itself because because it's true. I, I was just going to say the policeman said it was, um, what, did, what did he say, that the issuing of the fixed fines was um, uh, an oversight or an error? It wasn't, it was actually breaking the law. The police were breaking the law because they weren't following the law. Absolutely. Um, okay, now if you like what the UK Column does and you'd like to support us, then please head over to ukcolumn.org forward slash community. There are options to do that there and your help would be much uh, appreciated. Now uh, let's head over to, let's uh, have a look at some economic uh, uh, realities here. First of all, in order to make sure that nobody can get to work, uh, the government has decided that, or at least the uh, various transport companies decided that security guards are being deployed at rail stations uh, to control the numbers of people catching the train to work. 
Uh, there will be an increase in train services this week. Apparently there hasn't been, but that the government says there will be. Uh, and a series of measures have been introduced to control passenger numbers. Uh, One-way systems are being used at some stations uh, and uh, intercity services uh, running with, uh, res by reservation only. And I noticed over the weekend that uh, the West Coast Main Line are saying that uh, a third, one-third capacity uh, on the uh, West Coast, Coast Main Line and that everybody would be required to wear masks. Uh, while they're on the trains. Um, but in the meantime, the, as we were talking about on Friday's uh, news programme, of course, the unions uh, pushing forward with their policy here. So this is the NSU, uh, NASUWT, which is the, uh, one of the bigger teachers unions, uh, basically saying uh, that uh, teachers can legally refuse to return to work. Uh, in fact, this, uh, although they've been pushing this uh, on their website, for a little while, the, the uh, Guardian here is saying that uh, this is a, 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 an exclusive for them. Teachers can legally refuse to turn, re return to work. This is a, a letter from the uh, uh, NAS, NASUWT's General Secretary, Patrick Roach. He's saying stringent guidance has been issued uh, for the NHS, for care homes and for employers across the country. It's unacceptable that this has not been the case for schools. Uh, he, the NASUWT believes that teachers and other school staff have the right to the same consideration protections uh, and that they recognise that schools and employers have been placed in a situation where the wrong decision will result in people becoming seriously ill and dying and will therefore appreciate that there can be no compromise on health and safety. So this is being pushed forward, not just amongst the teachers, but actually globally now and, and across uh, all all businesses, sorry, let's go back to that one. Uh, so uh, this, uh, this is General Strike 2020, their website, you're not alone, the working class is waking up. Uh, and uh, of course they were uh, attempting to get people to go on strike, a general strike on the 1st of May. They're now aiming for the 1st of June for the next one. Uh, and they're offering support to do that. So the aim is to make sure that, uh, that it seems to be from the government side and from the union side, as we mentioned on Friday, the aim seems to be to completely destroy the economy, but don't worry, the banks are going to do the same. Uh, so here's Andy Haldane today uh, saying the economy is weaker than a year ago and we're now at the effector, effective lower bound. Well, we might dispute that somewhat. Uh, he went on to say so that in, in this sense, uh, dealing with COVID is something we'll need to look, la look at and, and negative interest rates, therefore, uh, are worth looking at. Uh, with somewhat greater immediacy. How could we not be? Uh, and he went on to say, uh, with quantitative easing, there's, uh, there's more that we can do on the gift side, oh, sorry, on the guilt side uh, and the corporate bond side in principle. As we find from other central banks, you could purchase asset classes further down the risk spectrum. So uh, I see David absolutely uh, killing himself with laughter there, but basically what we have here is Andy Haldane suggesting that the Bank of England in the not too distant future will be doing what the Federal Reserve has already started doing and buying junk bonds, buying any old junk that they can possibly get their hands on. Uh, because of course, this is the easiest way for them to pump uh, money into the, into the well, pump money into the financial system, not into the economy. Uh, so David, you know, between the, the unions, the government and the banks, uh, we seem to have a perfect storm here, absolutely determined to make sure that nothing survives economically. Oh, the stupid is running around and looking for things to do. I love the phrase, further down the risk spectrum, right? And, and the fact you quite correctly translated that, that means junk. That means what um, Max Kaiser used to call fecal backed securities, right? I mean, just, just rubbish. So that's what they're going to buy. And, and this negative interest rates, we're going to expand the balance sheet, we're going to print money, we're going to expand credit, we're going to buy everything and we're going to pump money into the economy. Uh, on the UK column extra last week, I mentioned a, a, a lecture um, by Gary North. He was discussing this and he had a phrase, a biblical phrase for it. And he said it's like, the biblical phrase is, um, uh, like a dog returns to its vomit. So the central bankers only have one solution. They keep going back there like a dog returns to its vomit. And here we have only one week later, Andy Haldane proving him right. Um, absolutely. Uh, now let's move swiftly on. Uh, Mark Seville, of course, has been uh, discussed on this programme in the last uh, week or so. Uh, this is the Times this morning. Sir Mark Seville urged to quit role as uh, civil service chief. 
to focus on coronavirus. Uh, so basically, this is Tobias Elwood, who's chairman of the Commons Defence Committee, uh, who is suggesting to Boris Johnson that he really needs to uh, reduce Mark Sedwell's, that Johnson needs to reduce Mark Sedwell's workload. Now, let's just to remind ourselves uh, what Sedwell's workload is, because he is head of the National Security Council. He's head of the Home Civil Service. He's uh, head of the Cabinet Office. Uh, he therefore m manages the whole uh, counter disinformation programs, uh, 77 Brigade. But as head of the uh, National Security Council, he's also got ultimate responsibility for GCHQ, uh, MI5, MI6, and the new Joint Biosecurity Centre, which is apparently going to uh, solve uh, all our problems uh, with respect to COVID-19, or, or more to the point, it's going to give them a new whole new intelligence uh, network uh, for them to spy on everybody as they contact trace and so on. So Tobias Elwood saying that really uh, when Theresa May had appointed or uh, you know made uh, Mark Sedwell uh, National Security Advisor and therefore head of the National Security Council, uh, that that was only supposed to be, or at least his continuing role as head of the civil services was really a temporary thing. And that really it's about time that this no longer, that the, the, the temporary aspect of it was implemented and he was removed from his job as the uh, head of the civil service. I think we, we could all echo that. Uh, and I'll just uh, mention uh, this uh, on the slog. Uh, Sunday essay, Sir Mark has minions in the shadow state now in control of Britain. Uh, a good little uh, uh, analysis of, of Mark Sedwell and exactly his role uh, within the uh, within the British government. Uh, David, we've been saying for quite some time that uh, Sir Mark Sedwell is uh, really running this country. Uh, that's increasingly the case. Um, and the question is, well, it reminds me of, of a particular scene from Yes, Prime Minister, where Sir Humphrey Appleby is, is uh, you know, satirically uh, asked whether he's taking on uh, too much. And of course, he doesn't want to relinquish any control whatsoever. I, I suspect that's uh, still 30 years later or whatever, still a very good representation of, how, of what's going on at number 10 at the moment. Yes, I mean, I, I wonder how Mark said, well, we'll feel about having his name taken off the paper, the head, the, the heading of the paperwork uh, of uh, Great Britain, Inc. I suspect he's not ready for any form of retirement or stepping back yet, and any suggesting any suggestion that he should uh, will mean some form of uh, internal conflict, bordering on civil war. Absolutely. Just wanted to give Seventy Seven Brigade a mention because, of course, we are criticising the government's policy on COVID nineteen, and therefore um, a whole brigade of the British Army will be monitoring everything we do to make sure that the cabinet office is safe and well. Uh, absolutely. Now, David, we're rapidly running out of time, but let's just uh, uh, have a look at this. Uh, Craig Murray, uh, of course, has been speaking out on many, many issues over the last few years, uh, but he uh, seems to have stepped over the line, perhaps, as far as the Scottish government's concerned when he uh, is covering the uh, trial of Alex Salmond. No, it's, it's amazing where the landmines actually are these days. So this is the Sun reporting. Ex-diplomat Craig Murray charged with contempt of court over the Alex Salmon trial. Former ambassador has been charged with contempt of court uh, after writing blogs about Alex Salmon's trial. The Crown Office has confirmed that the proceedings against Craig Murray have started. Now, um, things are so strange in Scotland these days I find myself now quoting the World Socialist website. I never thought this day would come, but here we go. Uh, they're, they're saying that Craig Murray's been charged and they're reporting some things from uh, Murray's website. Um, Murray, an SNP supporter, and, and then some, uh, reported that four other Scottish national social media commentators have been warned by the police of possible contempt charges, while a journalist unnamed has had his house raided and computers seized by police from the Alex Salmond team. A police van parked outside Murray's house for two days before he was charged. Elements within the media seem to be aware of charges against him. I would comment that we have seen exactly this in some of the cases we've supported uh, individuals on, that the, uh, the Crown Office communicate directly with tame journalists and you find out what's happening to, to your life through the press. This is, this is standard issue, standard practice in Scotland. 
Um, and the Law Social's website continues, but the legal charges and police intimidation used against them point fundamentally to the immense tensions building up around the Scottish Government and the SNP leadership in the aftermath of Salmon's acquittal. Instigated by the prosecution team at Salmon's trial, they appear to be an attempt to suppress public knowledge of what was revealed at the trial, a high-level conspiracy to send Salmon to jail on the flimsiest of charges. And I think that is a correct assessment. Now, other people are also now in the in the dock over the Salmon trial. Um, the ex-Sputnik editor um, has been charged over a menacing video which claims accusers would reap the whirlwind. Again, the Sun reporting here uh, with a, a slight, their own slight spin. It former editor of the Kremlin propaganda outlet Sputnik uh, has been charged over claims. Uh, it's said to be made in a video that Alex Salmon's accusers would reap a whirlwind. Cops confirmed Mark Hurst, Sputnik's FU, ex-UK editor-in-chief, was nicked over a reported menacing communication. Now, he is also a former SNP official and supporter of Alex Salmon. Um, and uh, he was referring to um, uh, Mr Murray's case. He said authorities in Scotland following the verdict in the Alex Salmon trial are now actively pursuing those independent supporters who publicly backed him. And this was picked up by Craig Murray himself, who tweeted out that we are one, one pace away from, quote, are you now or ever have you ever been a supporter of Alex Salmon, being, uh, being the question that the authorities would ask you before you're arrested. Um, the concern over this uh, is, is, is widespread in Scottish national circles. Here we see former Justice Minister Kenny McCaskill. He's talking of dark forces involved in the trial of Alex Salmon. As the Scotsman reporting, Kenny McCaskill believed dark forces were at work during the trial of Mr Salmon. Um, uh, he, he hit out at prosecutors for pursuing charges, which he bra branded utter bunkum and pretty flimsy. Now, again, it's strange for me to be agreeing with Kenny McCaskill, but there you go. One of the strange things about this, though, is, is, is the circular nature of this, because we were campaigning on this seven, eight years ago with Robert Green and others. Um, and uh, we've got here a, a quote from a, a blog covering the Lockerbie case where Jock Thompson QC uh, said the Crown Office is institutionally corrupt and the system is going to hell. Um, this was reported by this, this blog, the, 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 the state of the Crown Office, and it's reported in, in places like a, a magazine, a legal magazine called The Firm, and they ask what was re the response from Alex Salmond, Kenny McCaskill, and the Lord Advocate to that extraordinary claim? In a word, none. What are we to make of the deafening silence? So the irony here is that the very people who ignored the corruption within the Crown Office, who ignored the system going to hell, only eight years later are now in the dock and are being prosecuted in, 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 in a ridiculous manner that cannot be rationally sustained by those same forces. It's a part. It's it's a, a case of what you sow, you shall reap. It's a case of the a, an illegal, unlawful system that's that's there to control and subjugate people, turning on those who only eight short years ago were running it. Yes. Okay. Well, look. Uh, thanks for that, David. Let's move on quickly because we're well out of time. But I do want to I do want you to cover this. Uh, this is from RTE in Ireland. Uh, which, of course, the national broadcaster in Ireland. Uh, and their headline here is the importance of porn literacy for Irish young people. It is the opinion. There can be many reasons why young people in Ireland watch porn. So how can we support them in navigating their online sexual lives? So the assumption here is that young people should have online sexual lives. Uh, and I thought, well, that's strange because that's exactly the same as the situation in Scotland. Isn't that odd that it's happening at the same time? Here we see uh, some of the, the concern as parents take on John Swinney over porn lessons in the new curriculum. Uh, parents have accused Scottish schools of corrupting children with lessons about pornography, anal sex and transgender identity. And I thought, well, it's not a coincidence. There must be a common source, a common cause of all of this. And it didn't take long to find. 
Here we have a UNESCO document uh, called International Technical Guidance on Sexuality Education, an Evidence-Based Approach. This is part of Education 2030, part of the Sustainable Development Goals. And what is Education 2030? Uh, it's a, a, a UNESCO, United Nations Specialized Agency for Education, is running Education 2030, which is part of a global movement to eradicate poverty. Oh, we're going to eradicate poverty. That sounds fine. And it aims to ensure inclusive and equitable ed quality education and promote lifelong learning opportunities for all. Now, you might think, well, I don't see how teaching children that pornography is OK uh, falls into that. But apparently it does. We've got a little extract here. Uh, so from nine years on, um, the key idea we're teaching nine year olds is to describe what sexually explicit media pornography and sexting are. So we're teaching that in schools all around the world. Uh, explain what sexually explicit media, uh, that sexually explicit media often portrays men and women and sexual relations unrealistically. So it's not the harm that's doing the children. No, it's just it's, it's unrealistic. I uh, perceive that sexually explicit media can be misleading through inaccurate portrayals about men and women's sexual relations, identify and demonstrate ways to talk to a trusted adult about sexually explicit media and sexting. And the, the overall effect of this is to teach children to normalize pornography, to encourage the use of pornography, and to teach children it's fine, remove any stigma from it. This has been taught all around the world. It's been taught in Ireland, it's been taught in Scotland. It comes from UNESCO. It doesn't come from our own parliaments, our own legislatures, or or our own professionals or anything. It's it's imported and it's imposed upon us. Yeah, well, what can you say? Mm. Um, isn't Gordon Brown responsible for education with the, through the UN and UNESCO? He has some involvement, I do believe, yes. Yeah. Yes. Are we going to leave it there or do you want to do one no, more? Uh, well, I wondered about a COVID parting shot because apparently COVID's a very big thing at the moment. Okay. Uh, a COVID parting shot then, let's do that. Uh, so, uh, well, first of all, the COVID-19 lexicon series, uh, uh, David, social distancing has been defined as the process in which the supposed leadership acts so absurdly that the taxpayers lose faith in their ability to make a adult decisions. That seems like a fair uh, description. I think that's spot on. And what else has been spot on is a leaflet that has been circulated in Cork in Ireland. Um, this leaflet they see here uh, has been arranged to look like the COVID-19 leaflet that the government was putting out, but oh, it contains uh, radical ideas that uh, right-thinking people should be protected from. It's called Q19, and it says fascism, know the signs. And it advises you when they suppress all of your rights and tell you it's for your safety, when they put police on every corner and tell you we don't want to implement a police state, when they say it's temporary and extend the lockdown, then tell you it's the new normal. Uh, when their constant propaganda uh, keep preparing you for mandatory forced vaccinations, immunity cards and digital ID, then you know fascism has come. Well, isn't that spot on? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely spot on. David, thank you very much for joining us as always. We'll leave it there. And uh, we just say to our viewers and listeners, thank you for all of your wonderful support. We hope though that you are now starting to react to this information and let's get challenging some of those uh, politicians because they're very wobbly at the moment when presented with facts which uh, prove that the government policy is not correct. We'll leave it there. Thanks for joining us. Bye-bye.